Welcome to Crime, Corruption, and Cocktails, the true crime podcast where we look at cases of corruption and negligence and examine their historical and cultural implications. Today, I am drinking a Mike's Hard Lemonade. What about you? I am drinking a sake bomb, and on this week's episode, we're going to be looking at the group that calls themselves the Monster with 21 Faces. This group terrorized the Japanese food companies in the early 80s and led the police and the media on a wild goose chase with taunts and letters. The event started when the group broke into the home of Yoshi Izaki around 9 p.m. on March 18, 1984. The criminals broke into her home and tied her up with a cut telephone line. They retrieved the keys to her son's home, which had a security system installed. Her son was the Glico Candy Company president, Kachashua Izaki. Two masked men tied up his wife and his eldest daughter. His wife offered the men money and one of them responded, quote, be quiet, money is irrelevant, end quote. After cutting some more telephone lines, the two masked men located Azaki, who was bathing with his other two children. Azaki was abducted naked from his home and taken to a warehouse in Osaka. Three days after his abduction, Azaki was able to escape his captors after breaking free from the ropes they had used to tie him up. However, he was unable to identify the culprits or provide police with any clues as to their motives. Several weeks after Izaki's abduction, the group set fire to several vehicles at the company's headquarters. On April 16, 1984, a plastic container full of hydrochloric acid was found inside a Glico company building in Osaka. On April 8, 1984, the monster with 21 faces sent a letter to the police saying, quote, to Japanese police fools, are you stupid? There's so many of you. What on earth are you doing? If you are real pros trying to catch me, there's too much handicap, so I will give you a hint. There's no fellows in the Azaki's relatives. There's no fellows in the police. There's no fellows in the flood fighting corps. Car I use is gray. Food was brought in Dai. If you want a new info, beg for it in the newspaper. After telling you all this, you should be able to catch me. If you don't, you are tax thieves. Shall I kidnap the head of the police? End quote. The monster with 21 faces sent its first letter on May 10th to the giant food company Izaki Glico following the kidnapping and escape of Katsuhisa Izaki. The letter stated it had laced $21 million worth of the company's convections with potassium cyanide soda, and it later threatened to put them on store shelves. None of these poison candies were found, but Glico products were removed from stores, resulting in a loss of more than $20 million and the laying off of 450 part-time workers. By the end of the whole ordeal, Glico reported a total decrease in sales of nearly $130 million. On June 26, the monster with 21 faces issued a message proclaiming its forgiveness of Glico and subsequent harassment of the company ceased. Although they stopped terrorizing Glico, they were not finished. The monster with 21 faces began targeting Morinaga Marudai Ham and the House Food Corporation. In October 1984, a letter addressed to quote-unquote moms of the nation and signed by the monster with 21 faces was sent to Osaka news agencies. It stated that 20 packages of Morinaga candy had been laced with deadly sodium cyanide. After receiving this letter, police searched stores in cities from Tokyo to western Japan and found over a dozen lethal packages of Morinaga choco balls and angel pie before anyone was poisoned. These packages had labels such as danger contains toxins put on them. More tampered confections were found in February 1985 for a total of 21 poison candy products. On November 1, 1984, a threatening letter from the Monster with 21 Faces arrived at the Tokyo home of Morinaga Dairy Vice President. The letter said, quote, To President, you saw our power, didn't you? If you disobey us, we will destroy your company. You will get killed. Decide whether you want to give us money or do you want to see your company destroyed. Tell us in the Manichi newspaper on either the 5th or 6th of November. Use the missing persons. Use these words in the reply. Gyro, Morinaga, mother, police, bad friend, money, meal. 
As we said before, we want 200 million yen, monster with 21 faces, end quote. Morinaga responded on November 6th to the criminals by placing the missing persons advertisement in the Mainichi newspaper's morning edition. Two more letters from the monster with 21 faces were sent to House Foods on November 7th. The police superintendent, Yamamoto, of Shiga Prefecture died by suicide via self-immolation in April of 1985 due to not being able to catch the monster with 21 faces. Five days after this event, on August 12th, the monster sent its final message, quote, Yamamoto of Shiga Prefecture police died. How stupid of him. We've got no friends or no secret hiding place. It's Yashino or Shikata who should have died. What have they been doing for as long as one year and five months? Don't let bad guys like us get away with it. There are many more fools who want to copy us. No career Yamamoto died like a man. So we've decided to give our condolences. We've decided to forget about torturing food making companies. If anyone blackmails any of the food making companies, it's not us, but someone copying us. We are bad guys. That means we've got more to do other than bullying companies. It's fun to lead a bad guy's life. Signed, Monster with 21 Faces. End quote. After this letter, the monster with 21 faces was not heard from again. The statute of limitations for the kidnapping of Azaki, the president of Glico, ran out in June of 1995, and the statute of limitations for the attempted poisoning ran out in February of 2000. At one point, it was estimated that over 1 million police officers had worked on the case in some capacity. Again, no suspect was ever charged, despite the police chasing down more than 28,000 tips and investigating nearly 125,000 persons of interest. So let's jump into some theories and suspects in the case of the monster with 21 faces. The most prominent suspect was the fox-eyed man. On June 28, 1984, two days after the monster agreed to stop harassing Marudai Ham in exchange for 50 million yen. Police came close to capturing the suspected mastermind. An investigator disguised himself as an employee and followed the monster's instruction for the money exchange. As he was riding a train to the money drop-off point, he noticed a suspicious man watching him. He was described as a large, well-built man wearing glasses and with his hair cut short and perm. He was also quoted to have, quote, eyes like those of a fox, end quote. In a later incident, investigators saw the fox-eyed man again, accompanying the alleged monster group during another secret money exchange with House Food Company. He was able to elude police and avoid capture, and the fox-eyed man has never been identified. Another suspect was the videotape man. Following threats by the monster with 21 faces to poison Glico confections and the resulting mass withdrawal of Glico products from shelves, a man wearing a Yami Yuri giant baseball cap was caught placing Glico chocolate on a store shelf by a security camera. The security camera photo was made public after this incident. The Tokyo Metropolitan Police also suspected that various Yakuza groups had a hand in these crimes. The end of the blackmail campaign occurred around the time of the Yamaichi War, the mob war between the Yamaguchi Gumi and the Ichiwakai. The final theory is that the monster with 21 faces was a group of victims from, from the Morinaga milk arsenic poisoning incident. From June 5, 1955, certain infants in western Japan came down with a strange sickness that was characterized by diarrhea or constipation, vomiting, a swollen abdomen, and a darkening of skin color. All of the infants shared the same characteristic. They were bottle-fed powdered milk, which was eventually discovered to be the Morinaga milk brand. According to William R. Cullen, Morinaga milk showed little interest over studies of the surviving affected infants, which resulted in some boycotting the company's products during the 1960s. The company was brought to trial, however, however, the Tokushima District Court found them not guilty, as well as denying any recompense for the survivors. This decision was subjected to a review by an appellate court in Takamatsu High Court, which resulted in the not guilty verdict being reversed on March 31, 1966. 
After a rejected final appeal three years later, the Tokushima District Court found the Morinaga Milk's head of factory production guilty and sentenced him to three years in jail. Since the poisoning, multiple studies have been done on the people who survived the milk poisoning incident. Many have reported that they still suffered chronic health problems, and studies have also reported quote-unquote substantially higher rates of sensory deficits and mental retardation in adolescent survivors of the Morinaga poisonings. In April 1974, the Hikari Foundation was established in order to help the Morinaga poisoning victims. By the end of March 1983, there were 13,396 victims of the Morinaga milk poisoning, and 6,389 of these were in communication with the Hikari Foundation. Who do you think was the monster with 21 faces? It's really hard to say. Um, I kind of want it to be these people that were affected by the milk poisoning, just like as a revenge, because I don't blame them at all. It makes me think of the thalidomide disaster, which we talked about a while ago. I guess realistically, it seems like the mob was probably conning someone or blackmailing someone. Maybe, you know, they had done a favor for one of the heads of the corporations and they didn't get their compensation or something like that, because this seems very organized. I will say, I think some of the letters, I mean, they gave so many details about themselves that I don't think it was all true. I feel like they did a lot of it to throw police off their trail, but who knows? Maybe that's a cultural difference that I don't understand. This whole situation is so strange and scary, and it's so crazy to think that decades later, we still are not any closer to knowing who did it. So I definitely do think that the most plausible answer to the question of who the monster with 21 faces is, it's probably the fox-eyed man in connection with the Yakuza. There has been a really big bribery problem. And so it wouldn't surprise me if the Yakuza and the heads of these companies had dealings with each other and if as a group the food companies were not cooperating with the Yakuza, the Yakuza would then retaliate and build a campaign against them. The monster with 21 faces routinely taunted the police with clues of their crimes and reacted to the actions of the police including the superintendent's suicide. Other criminals have used this tactic. One of the main theories centers around the Monster with 21 Faces being a group that wanted revenge on food companies. Morinaga is not the only company that has put profits over people's lives. The EpiPen was developed in 1977. The company Mylan acquired the auto-injector which precisely calibrates the epinephrine dosage in 2007. EpiPens were about $57 when Mylan acquired it. Today, it costs more than $500 in the U.S., which is a 400% increase. Another case involves Martin Screlly, who, as CEO of Turing Pharmaceuticals, had jacked up the price on the drug Daraprim by 5,000%. Daraprim is used as an anti-malarial and toxoplasmosis drug for patients who are HIV positive. It currently costs about $750 per pill. The biopharmaceutical company sought to portray its price hike as costly only to insurance companies and not consumers, but patients were still slapped with copays ranging from $1,000 to even more than $16,000, according to the memo from the Democratic staff of the House Committee on Oversight and Government Reform. Jenny, what do you think we can do to prevent incidents such as these and the numerous others that we didn't cover? I think a lot of times it can feel, you know, like as an individual, you can't do that much to help these things. But I feel like voting is probably a big way voting people into office that don't the best interests of companies in mind over like we're saying people's lives and livelihood. Otherwise, I mean, I would say like, don't buy from these companies. But I mean, if you need an an EpiPen, you need an EpiPen. And it's just really horrible that people have to decide between their health and their rent or their health and getting groceries. It's embarrassing that people have to live this way still and that the country that Del and I live in, the United States, thinks we're so much better than everyone else. But, you know, people can't even afford medication and they have to rely on others to help them recover from cancer and surgeries and things like that. 
I would actually support what most other developed countries do, such as European nations, Australia, New Zealand, Canada, and they actually have price controls on medicine. So companies don't have the ability to hike up prices. So despite all the police's efforts, no one was ever charged. The monster with 21 faces remains a fugitive from justice. And since the statute of limitations has run out, no one can even be charged with any crimes connected to this case. So Jenny, do you think anyone will ever claim responsibility for the crimes committed by the monster with 21 faces? I really don't think so, unfortunately. To me, this case is kind of like what's done is done. The people are proud of what they got away with. I guess they didn't do anything else. I mean, you know, maybe they went on to commit individual crimes, but if they didn't act publicly as the monster with 21 faces again... Maybe, if anything, I think we could have someone say like, oh yeah, like I think my dad was involved in that, or I think my aunt played a part in this. Even a deathbed confession I don't really think is going to happen. I feel like they seem to be at peace with what they've done. And who knows, they might not even be alive now. I think that in this case, it was more so they wanted the results that they wanted. You know, they just wanted the companies to feel pain and they wanted the companies to suffer. And since that happened, they were able to move on with their lives and call it a day. And I do believe that they probably didn't commit any other crimes. It definitely seems like this was very targeted. I agree with you when you say that it's probably unlikely that even a deathbed confession will happen, but we might hear some relative come later on, you know, and find some hidden thing, maybe a unsent letter that was signed from the monster with 21 faces. I think that even with the statute of limitations not in place, they don't want the attention. They don't want the questions. They don't want the interviews. They just want to be left alone if they're still alive. That wraps up this week's case. Thank you for listening. Let us know in the comments what you think about the monster with 21 faces. You can read more about this case and how to support us in the links below. We will be back next week with a brand new episode where we take a look back on our previous cases as we celebrate the 50th episode of Crime, Corruption, and Cocktails. As always, stay safe. Thank you.